Gray County. Hello and welcome to this special edition COVID-19 Rogers Television program. My name is Carol Merton and today I am delighted to welcome two guests who are going to be talking about housing. And we all know how important that topic is in our area and far farther afield as well. With me today, in no particular order, I have Tim Hudak, who is the, now let me get this right, because in COVID, everybody's titles and portfolios keep changing. So I, I, you'll have to correct me if I don't have it right. But Tim is the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. And have I got that right, Tim? Exactly, Carol. And thanks oh. for having me back on the show. I'm really excited to be here. Excellent. And I also have Jennifer Tedford. And Jennifer, when I pulled up your information, um, there was sort of broker and real estate agent beside your name. And have I got that right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a broker with Remax Grey Bruce Realty. We've got uh, offices in Own Sound, Tara and Chesley. Excellent. So I want to welcome you both because Jennifer, for sure, I'll be looking to you to fill us in a little bit about the local picture. Um, and also Tim, you know, for sure, the larger perspective as well. Now, ARIA or the Ontario Real Estate Association, I was, I, I looked it up, I did my homework and it, it is a Canada, it is Canada's largest provincial real estate association with at least 85,000 realtors connected with it. Is that right? That's right, and, and growing, and growing. And growing. No surprise to you, Carol, and that's why you have Jennifer and I back. I mean, I think real estate now has, has passed COVID, hockey, and the weather on topics that Ontarians <laughs> like to discuss over their barbecue. Absolutely, you guys are number one. <laughs> so, um, I also want to acknowledge, Tim, that you you received an award not too long ago, and I, I you know I don't know if you were planning on mentioning it, but I want to congratulate you um, as a North American real estate leader um, and by SP 200. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, thanks, Gretchen. I certainly was going to mention, but but um, it's it's um, up on the wall uh, at, at the office uh, when I get back there next. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's uh, Swanpool, which is a real estate consulting company, does a North American leaders, and I was very honored uh, to be chosen. Uh, now, you know, I'm on the top 200 uh, North American residential real estate leaders. So uh, I get there because I can ask for people like Jennifer, smart people, for advice. I'm just a pretty face, and I don't do so good at that, but I managed to crack the list. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So. Who'd like to start first because this is a hot topic and there's so many questions what does affordable housing mean well maybe i'll, I'll start jennifer can give the local perspective for uh owen sound and, and the counties um you know affordable home ownership has been a hallmark uh, you you know this from your media work a hallmark of ontario's middle class I mean, for every generation we had a better shot at owning a home than our parents or our grandparents. A home is not only your biggest investment you're likely to make, but it's where you're most comfortable and secure. It's where you raise your family. It's the place of your fondest memories. Um, it changes you as a person. I remember when my wife Debbie and I uh, bought our first home in 2002, I cared more about how the place looked. I invested it. I cared more about the neighbors. We got involved as volunteers. The kids of homeowners do better. So making sure we have affordable home ownership is really essential to Canada's middle class and our strength as a country. But sadly, that is slipping out of reach, whether you're in Toronto, Owen Sound, Meaford, or Fort Erie. Now, has COVID changed this, or was this starting to happen before COVID? And COVID now has brought it even, pardon the pun, closer to home. Do you want to lead on that one? Sorry, um, I, I think so. You know, um, we were... Um, we knew our prices were going to rise in Gray and Bruce counties, um, but we didn't expect them to jump 50% in two years. And it seemed to be a, a outflux of people coming from the Golden Horseshoe, coming up this way, the GTA, Kitchener, Guelph, uh, looking for some place where they could get a little more space. So 
unfortunately, that's affected uh, the whole, well, it's good if you're a seller, but it's not so great if you're a buyer, right? Yeah, so you're here to sit on both sides of the fence, right? <laughs> Honestly, I, I would like to see a little bit more of a, a moderated market. Um, you know, it's it's stressful for sellers too. You know, if you get uh, an offer and there's there's 30 offers sitting in front of you, you know that that's stressful for them as well. And uh, so a little more be, uh, middle ground would be kind of nice right about now. Yeah, yeah. Carol, I, I can add to that too from a provincial perspective. Um, we did a study, and, and your viewers are encouraged to go to OREA, O-R-E-A, OREA.com. They can see it. We, we looked at the attitude you asked about. Have people shifted their desires as a result of, of COVID? And, and they did in two significant ways. Uh, number one, people were looking for, for more space in their home, maybe, you know, an office. Maybe grandma's going to move in with the family, that kind of thing. So we saw a shift to larger spaces. And then we did see a shift to smaller town Ontario that, that Jennifer just described that, People you now can work from home or more often do so, or maybe accelerate their plans to live in a small town. So, you know, the secret that you've had about what an awesome time it is to live along Georgian Bay or, or Lake Huron and watch the sunset, that secret is out. And one of the biggest areas of increase, quite frankly, has been in those types of properties as folks have moved out of the GTA uh, and found great places to live in, in Grey Bruce and Owen Sound. So... I'd like to drill down a little bit into terminology because everyone seems to have a different understanding around the terms affordability and attainability. And I'm wondering if you can help me understand when, when you, you use the affordability term, what are you really meaning? You know, is it a dollar figure? Is it a percentage of income that people make? What does it mean? <laughs> now, was that a tough question? It's Maybe a tricky I should question, have for sure. You go, Tim. <laughs> yeah, it is a tricky question because, you know, I, I'm not putting on my old politician hat and trying to, to dance around it like I used to do in, in question period, right? It's um, The reality is it may mean different things to different people at different stages of life. Uh, you know, in general, affordability means that you can make the mortgage payment, but still put, you know, food on the table for your kids, sock away some bucks for for tuition when they they grow up and maybe put some aside for the vacation someday right that's mm -hmm. it's kind of will be a different different uh, ball of wax for different types of people a big focus that we have here at the ontario real estate association is to bring affordability closer to reach and that's slipping away like i bet you if you grew up in owen sound like you know myself coming from niagara you always thought that if you worked hard you played by the rules you got your degree you got a decent job you can buy a home in the neighborhood you grew up in at the very least and that is slipping away today. So we put a big focus on what Jennifer said earlier, more choice in the marketplace, whether that's starter homes, move up homes and the kids need more space or places for empty nesters to still stay in town, but free up the family home. We really need housing across the board, including rental housing. That's a big part of our focus. And I know some area members like Bill Walker have worked hard on this. We do have some more positive news uh, coming, but we fell behind really Carol, because for over two decades, we were not building enough homes in small towns or big cities to keep up with demand. And I have first time home buyers that can afford a house, Carol. They're pre-approved, you know, 350, 375, but they can't attain the home because other people are going in um, with no conditions. You know, they've got the money, you know, whether investments are in the bank and they go in and buy it. First time home buyers, they, they have to get the approval from the bank and they have to go through the steps. So they can afford a house, but they're having trouble attaining one. And that distinction is really important to make because, you know, it, it, it also refers to housing type availability that you might be able, a senior might want to sell their bigger home, but there may not be smaller homes on the market that might be available in any particular community. Have I understood that correctly as well? Very true. And my, my parents went through that. They're looking to downsize from the family home and uh, find a smaller place in, in a town of about 30,000 people. And it was really tough. Uh, they eventually did. And that meant a new young family can move into, you know, the place where, where they raised us. So that certainly is an issue. And we do have a lot of um, outdated zoning laws, Carol, that date back to the 1970s that stand in the way. Often governments have put on a sort of one size fits all straight jacket of rules and regulations that might make sense in downtown Toronto, but, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't fit a, a Kincardine, 
uh, or a Wireton, you know, for example. So more flexibility for local councils to reflect the local priorities in the area um, would make a lot of sense. I did have the honor of sitting on a housing affordability task force that Premier Ford um, yeah. struck. We, we brought a report in. I'm happy to talk more about that. But Please. we did have to yeah. create about 1.5 million more homes in the next 10 years just to keep up with demand and lack of supply in the past because of the red tape. So I just want to um, drill back a little bit to affordability and then absolutely I want to talk about certainly that task force and the recommendations that have come forward. So um, there's the price of a home and that's a, it, it changes based on market, but affordability I've heard referenced as 30% of your gross income would be, need to go to housing and you need to be able to live off the other 70%. So Jennifer, when you're helping people with home ownership and you're talking about the financial part, do you use that figure or do, does that ever come up in discussions at all? Or how does that work when they say, well, can I really afford this home? I don't know if I can really afford this home. Or is that the bank's responsibility with the mortgage approval process? Absolutely. We want to make sure that uh, a prospective buyer has done their due diligence. So okay. they've spoken to their bank, their mortgage broker, and, and they've been pre-approved. They know what their budget is. Um, and with first-time home buyers, sometimes now isn't the right time. And a good mortgage broker will say, okay, I need you to do this and this and this. And then in a few months, we can and look at getting a home. Uh, and I think those are the important things is that you do those first steps before you go searching for a house. Right. Now, Jennifer, you're involved in rental property as well, correct? Mm -hmm. So real estate isn't just selling property. You, you help people find rental properties available as well. 100%. And the rental market, is it as restrict like not restricted, as less available than, than affordable housing? Where are we certainly in our area for rental housing availability? Yeah, it's it's the same um, serious situation. You know, there, there are people living on the streets. There's people couch surfing because there isn't an affordable place for them to live. Um, I'm a landlord and a realtor, um, you know, and, and one of the things that I would love the governments to sit back is take a look at the Landlord Tenant Act. Um, mm -hmm. The Landlord Tenant Act has, has uh, a lot of good aspects on it, both sides, but it does sort of restrict landlords a little bit. And the landlords field, in order to protect themselves, they have to, to raise the price. And yeah. unfortunately, the, the tenants are bearing the brunt of that. And uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, when they talk about affordable housing, that the governments really have to sit and look at that. Now, Tim, I, I know you referenced your early years as, as a politician. So this is a bit of a political question. Where does affordability, who owns the responsibility for affordable housing? You know, I've heard it said, uh, you know, that there's a lot of direction in different ways. Well, it's their issue or their issue. Who really owns this? So think of it this way, um, like the the Olympics, the, the gold medal, the top of the podium would be the provincial government. They'd have the most impact on housing affordability. Okay. They also regulate the real estate industry. So the, the rules that uh, Jennifer has to abide by the education, the ongoing education that's set by the province. Silver medal I would give to municipalities because ultimately the province can hand over a toolbox to bring in more housing, but the municipalities have to use those tools so people can move into Owen Sound in a place they can afford. Then the third is the, the federal level. Now they do uh, regulate mortgages, for example. The, they have their agencies that set interest rates uh, and such. But where the federal government can play the most use, I would say, is in rewarding provinces, municipalities that are pro home ownership. So if a municipality says we want to welcome new people to the area, but we can't do so because this water and sewer project, we need a recreation center or such, I would say the federal government and the provincial, when you do those types of, of initiatives in your budget, put at the top of the list municipalities that are welcoming new neighbors and new residents. And if they stand against them, they're NIMBYs who want to keep them out of town, well, then move their project to the bottom of the list. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are a, a variety of task forces, and Tim, I know you're going to be talking more about the provincial one that you were working on. Um, but but even in a county level, which is upper tier municipal, you know, upper tier, and then municipal levels, 
there are working groups or task forces. So far, I've, I've never heard of developers or real estate brokers or agents on local working groups to provide input. I know you were there at the provincial level. Is there a role for developers and real estate brokers or agents at the local working groups around affordable housing? You know, absolutely so. And I, I have seen that. Um, I'm, I to say I'm not up to speed on what's happening in, in Gray Bruce, but in other parts of the province, we do have realtor members that are part of those committees. Okay. We've seen home builders as well, which I think is smart because they know where the demand is going to be. Jennifer spends her whole day, right, looking out for her clients. She knows what they're looking for and where they're coming from. So that's wise advice. Plus, you know, realtors are very well educated in what's happening in the community as a whole. They're the consummate generalists. They know what the schools are like, you know, what the crime is yes. like, what else is coming into the area, what the parks are like. They do a very valuable um, service. And, you know, I think they can also be there as the champions for the people who got the degree, got the job, yeah. and still live in mom and dad's basement, right? You need the champion yeah. to be their voice at the table. Yeah, so they're very much the local content experts around the communities. Would you agree, Jennifer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I Personally, myself, I would like to see zoning rules sort of relax a little bit. Um, a a two-by-four is $8 now. So, you know, we can build new houses, but that's not necessarily going to make them affordable, right? Um, if they can relax the zoning rules, maybe that great big huge house that's only zoned to be a single-family home, if you didn't have to jump through so much red tape, maybe it become, could become a duplex or a triplex. Uh, you know, those are the small things that, well, they're not small, but the things that we could do at more of a municipal level that, that's going to um, alleviate some of the problems. Were they, was that part of the recommendation then, Tim, that came forward when you were working on a provincial affordability task force? Yeah, we could have used Jennifer's help. That was one of the uh, the top ones. She's, she's right on. And <laughs> It, it lines up too, um, Carol, with what you're saying about uh, more rental housing. So one of the key areas of red tape prevents people from turning part of their house uh, into a secondary suite, whether that's a family member or a student who's moving in or a you know, young family starting out. That'd be a great source of income for the homeowners, but also would mean more quality rentals in, in every neighborhood in our province. So we do call for that what we say is as of right that you would have the right to do so as long as you follow the rules around you know fire protection and health and safety and such mm -hmm. uh, and secondly yeah I mean, jennifer nailed one of our big issues like picture a wartime bungalow maybe in owen sound and if somebody wanted to to knock that down uh, and build a monster four-story home they can do so you know and, and they're welcome to do that that's their property we believe in that but that's for one family but if it was a good sized property, they want to make it into a duplex or a triplex uh, or a series of homes that new homeowners could afford. Boy, they go through this red tape, you know, ringer that drives the prices through the roof and it ends up killing the project. So there's level the playing field. If you want to build up, great, but also allow owners to build more homes that, that average people can afford. So as you're speaking, it occurs to me that many communities have economic development committees or working groups if you are looking to build business and have workers come to your community but they can't find homes it's a real disadvantage so Tim from your experience with Jennifer how do, how closely do you link with those who are uh, involved with economic development and tourism for that matter Quite, quite closely, and our task force did hear from, from those groups, and ARIA supports partnerships among realtors and, and builders, economic development. It only makes sense. You, you gave a great description of what we're encountering in many communities. They've got businesses that want to create the jobs, but they can't find workers because workers can't afford the housing uh, yeah. in, in the area. So one of the recommendations we brought forward is that kind of uh, fund that will help municipalities you know, build the infrastructure so you can pave the way for more homes and reward those municipalities that are pro-jobs uh, and pro-affordable housing. The last thing I'll throw on the table that Rhea's talked about and our task force did as well, in the same ballpark as converting large residences or large properties to more homes, we do have excess commercial space now, as well as some excess oh. government space. With work from home, businesses will probably shrink their footprint. So you could easily convert that to housing. It's already built, it's already serviced. That's good for the environment. So we think that's a very, very key recommendation as well. Jennifer, 
what are your thoughts about laneway houses and tiny homes and I mean, we mentioned secondary suites, which is slightly different. Is there a place or a role for those in communities to address affordability? 100% Carol, um, okay. you know, they, um, I, I'm seeing uh, more and more families merging, you know, um, mom and dad living with the kids, uh, brother and sisters, you know, co co cohabitating because that's the only way they can afford to. So absolutely tiny houses are something that needs to be considered or my mother says she's going to have a granny pot and she's going to live out back someday. And, and, but it, but it's ideal, especially after COVID, you know, when you've, you've got uh, your seniors in, in uh, nursing homes and you can't go see them. Right. So, so, this has all sort of changed our way of thinking. And I think over the, you know, the, the next several years, we're, we're just going to learn from what we've been through over the last two years and um, hopefully take some something positive from it and, uh, and learn. One of the um, interesting learnings uh, as I move through this whole topic of affordable housing, there are groups now looking at the social financialization of housing, which means things like community bonds or any of those social finance initiatives to support housing. Tim, have you come across any of those discussions at all? You know, we, we did. Um, and uh, in our task force, we talked a bit about um, social housing, not-for-profit housing. We need housing across the spectrum. The challenge we face today, too, Carol, is if people can't get into the into the market for first-time home buyers, then they stay in rentals, and that means people in social housing want to move up, get stuck there, and ultimately, who pays the price for the lack of housing? It's our most vulnerable citizens who could end up dramatically underhoused or or in the streets. So we we did look at that. One of the suggestions was that there could be um, a fee that's paid as new builders build uh, that goes to a larger fund that helps out not-for-profits uh, in social housing. Mm -hmm. My last point on this is there's some really interesting technologies too, financial technologies that will allow first time home buyers to buy a home. I think Jennifer would probably agree. I'd love to hear her comments on it, but it's not usually the mortgage that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's finding the money for that, for the down payment to finance the home. So these are um, like modern version of rent to own where you could have co-investment from a pension, for example, uh, a business investor, or even the government to help you buy the home. And then you pay that ownership off over time. Either when you sell the home, they get a piece of the return uh, or with additional payments over time. These technologies have helped outside of Canada. We'd love to see them get first time home buyers their first keys by involving those in the province of Ontario as well. Jennifer, have you had anyone ask you about that or have you had any any inkling that might come forward? Um, the Bruce and Gray County, they had done that in the past where it's a first time home, home ownership. So they would give them the down payment. Um, they had to live there for so many years. And I believe Bruce County is doing it again this year, but there's certain thresholds, you know, that people have to make so much. Um, but the price of the home in the Bruce County program, I believe is only 340,000. So it's going to be pretty hard to find a, a home that's going to meet that criteria. Um, but absolutely, we've been doing that in Gray and Bruce County for years. Yeah. yeah, and and that's that's good to know. And but certainly, like you say, um, it may not match now. You know, certainly where the affordable homes are for sure. Where do you think we're going to head um, as we move forward? Uh, because uh, it, it is concerning, and it's concerning from a community growth perspective and also for those who just want to have a place to call home. Um, in, in the short term, uh, I think it's going to be rough, but I'll tell you um, why I'm optimistic uh, as well. In a recent study ARIA did, and again, your viewers can see it at ARIA.com, said, okay, this bank of mom and dad, does it exist and how, how deep is it? And we found that four in 10 first time home buyers that are 18 to 38 years old, Carol, four in 10 receive substantial financial assistance from the parents. Get this, for direct payments, not loans, just direct gifts, the average was about $72,000 that parents took out of their own savings to give their kids. On top of that, a lot gave loans as well uh, in the neighborhood of almost $50,000. So that's a lot from the bank of mom and dad. It shows they love their kids, you know, they've saved up their money, great, but it poses the problem that you may have, the only people that can buy homes 
are those that come from well-off families. And you're going to divide Ontario among the housing haves and the have-nots. I'm really worried about that, the impact that will have on our society. Here's why I'm optimistic. The answers are actually on the table. Um, we put them forward, uh, the realtors like Jennifer and Aria, the housing task force. We do hear there may be some new housing legislation coming forward soon that would be very pro home ownership. That's great. And in 2020, we actually built more homes than we have in over 20 years. We cracked the 100,000 mark in the province of Ontario. So the government did listen to our advice. We're pleased to see a very pro home ownership government there. More work to be done. So I, I do see some light coming down because we did have a really good year last year and I'm excited about the year ahead. So uh, when you say coming ahead, is there like a time frame, two to five years, three to five years? We just got through COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did see um, the problem, like it's crazy to believe we have a lot more demand. Millennials, you know, getting into their home buying years, for example, <laughs> immigration people move into your area because it's a great place to live. We actually built fewer homes in the last like, few years than we did in the 1970s, right? Like it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But we did see an uptick. Um, you know, Rhea did give advice to government. They took eight of 10 of our ideas in what was called the More Homes, More Choice Act in 2019, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And as a result, 2020 and 2021 did have increases in supply. So it's the right track. We hope the new bill will do more. Um, that's the path we need to be on. So, so I do see more positive options coming forward today and certainly yeah in the next couple of years hopefully they'll stay on this course and from a real estate point of view i think that this year they're predicting a 10 percent price increase but i think we're going to see moderation down the road interest rates are going to go up now we do have a few wild cards you know we have a, a, a budget coming out from the federal government in the spring so it, it'll depend on what is is said there and then of course everything that's going on in the ukraine but i'm going to remain confident that we will see a moderation in the market and if there's a moderation you know maybe a slight price decrease then maybe more people will be able to get into the market for sure so hope a bit of an increase potentially over the short term, but then hopefully a moderation as well. So homes are, are being built. It's being able to have enough that is affordable for people to make those transitions. Is that correct? Sure. I can't see more help for first time home buyers. There is a first time home buyer tax credit that waives part of the land transfer tax. We think that will give them a leg up. I mentioned earlier yeah. that there are some people who are being pushed out of the market because they don't come from wealthy families. So that kind of assistance would give them more of a fair shot at getting their own home. Yeah. I can't believe the time has gone by so quickly. I want to thank both of you for being on the program. And I do hope you'll come back again where we can talk about housing and finding homes for individuals. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our viewing audience for joining us today to learn more about services and programs that are available to you and to your family. Please take care and stay safe. Thank you. This program is brought to you by NBA League Pass. More dunks, more slams, more to love, live in HD. NBA League Pass, part of the Rogers Super Sports Pack. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Gavin Bryant, centerman with the Owen Sound Attack. Catch great OHL action on Rogers TV as we bring you Owen Sound Attack games live, both home and away. As the fighting continues in Ukraine, thousands of people are fleeing for their lives, forced to leave everything behind. You can help them. Your donation.